Financial Affairs. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. Today, we delve into the pulse of Saskatchewan's municipal landscape as we explore what mayors across the province are seeking from provincial leaders in the upcoming Saskatchewan provincial election slated for October of this year. Now, the recently concluded SUMA convention held in Regina, Saskatchewan, served as a pivotal platform where municipal leaders congregated to advocate for their respective communities and engage with provincial party leaders. Premier Scott Moe and NDP leader Carla Beck delivered keynote addresses outlining their vision for municipal provincial partnerships. Premier Mo articulated his vision for strengthening collaboration between municipalities and the provincial government, emphasizing the importance of robust partnerships in addressing key issues facing communities across Saskatchewan. Here is his address to delegates. And thank you and welcome everyone uh, here today. Um, first of all, uh, Randy, not only thank you for the kind introduction, but thank you for what you do as uh, being the president of SUMA, running to be the president of SUMA and the leadership that you provide uh, our municipalities and that municipal, or sorry, that leadership that you provide our municipal, urban municipal municipalities across the, uh, across the province alongside your board members and uh, my equal thanks uh, goes to them. A number of colleagues uh, from the legislature have joined us here today. I welcome them as well. And most importantly, um, I welcome all of you uh, as, as our municipal, our urban municipal, uh, representatives from across the province and I thank you for what you do each and every day in your community making your community a better place and advocating on behalf of the needs uh, in your community but also advocating on and identifying where uh, the opportunities may be uh, as you know about a month ago or I spoke at or a few weeks ago I spoke at the SARM convention here in Regina as well and I think you're going to hear many of the same themes today that we did uh, at that point in time the theme of a, of a government in the province that's focused on growth, focused on investment, both attracting private investment, but also making equal public investments and certainty. Certainty for the residents that we collectively represent across this province in all of our communities. And I would say that we also are associated with representing across the nation of Canada. So growth, investment and cer certainty are really going to be the themes about what I want to discuss here today and the themes of what our go government is focused on in the days ahead. So I'll begin by just maybe a few comments about with, or with respect to the, the current state of where we are in Saskatchewan today. A few years ago, we, we updated our growth plan. In 2012, we had came out with a growth plan that was a vision out to 2020 for this province, a growth plan that was consulted on with you and, and others. We updated that a number of years ago and even just today, we are meeting or even exceeding some of the targets that we had put forward in that most recent growth plan that we had hoped to achieve by the time we got to the year 2030. Now growth isn't a word that you heard a whole lot about in this province prior to about 16 years ago. And you still don't hear it as much as I would like to hear it at the federal level today. But for the last 16 years, you've seen a couple of leaders and many ministers stand on stages like this and talk about this government's commitment to facilitating growth in our communities and in our industries and facilitating, facilitating the opportunities that come with said growth. And we're starting to see those results. Our population growth in this province is at historic levels today. There's now, as of 8 o'clock this morning, 1,232,390 people that call it Saskatchewan community their home. That is important because that is the most ever and tomorrow I expect will be higher than that and that will be the most ever individuals that have called the Saskatchewan community home. Today our rate of growth into the province, rate of people that are staying in the province is at its greatest level ever, pardon me, not ever, but in the last 110 years. So for me that's ever. Our population this past year grew by over 30,000 people. We will reach quite likely 1,250,000 people this calendar year living in the, in the province of Saskatchewan. And on those people that are arriving here, they're working in our communities. There's 30,000 jobs that have been created uh, in Saskatchewan since 2020. 10,500 of those jobs came just in the last 12 months alone. With those and creating those jobs is capital investment that is being invested in communities and near communities across this province. In fact, our capital investment this last year was up 25 percent. 
What that has done is ranked us second in the nation when it comes to attracting capital investment. And the forecast for the current year that we're already a quarter of the way through is for Saskatchewan's capital investment attraction to increase yet another 15%. That will put us first in the nation when it comes to capital investment coming into our community, creating jobs, and furthering that growth agenda that we have. In addition to that, and partially probably the reason behind that capital investment are, is the value of our exports. The value of Saskatchewan exports, and this is an important number when you consider that 70% of everything we do is reliant on exporting, 1.2 million people exporting to over 150 nations around the world. This is the source of our wealth in our community. If you're not working in an export related business, you're likely serving those that do. And the values of our exports since 2018 in Saskatchewan are up 70%. Not the production, but the actual value of what we are exporting. So we are, we are exporting not only more product, but we are exporting far higher value products than we did even just five short years ago. So many other, so many other economic indicators are up in our communities and we see this on a daily basis and sometimes we take it for granted. And so it saves me to mention it to here today. Our agricultural food exports up. Our crop production is up, despite some areas experiencing a drought for multiple years, overall our crop production continues to increase. Our value added processing is up in the province and investment in that space is significant. Our mining industry is strong, investment in that space is significant. Our energy industry is continuing to attract investment. The list goes on and on and on of the industries that are performing well in this province and performing above uh, their their counterparts in like industries across the nation and around the world. And I bring this up as to say, for me to say, you know, why does this matter or, or why is this important to you in this room? It's because growth indicates a strong and resilient economy and it's through the strength of that economy that we're able to make investments. Whether that be a provincial government, we use the strength of our provincial economy to make investments on your behalf. Whether it be at the municipal level, at the community level, you use the equal strength of your economy to make those investments on behalf of the, to provide the services on behalf of the people that you serve. Now there are challenges that come with this type of growth. We face those at the provincial level. And I know that everyone in this room is encountering like challenges, those same challenges of growth in your own communities. But my question to you today would be this. Would you rather face those challenges of growth or would you rather face challenges of declining growth? And we know what those can be, those challenges of decline. They can be a shrinking population in your community, in your province, in your nation, a smaller tax base to, which will not help you pay for the services that people expect to be provided. Be people leaving this province, some of them are children for opportunities that may exist elsewhere and we've seen that in our province in years gone by. It may be businesses not investing back into their community. But I would say today we are in a, a much stronger place, a stronger place due to the strength of our economy. We are able to make those investments. A strong and growing economy means that we can invest and invest heavily at times. Today, most of what I want to discuss is very much pertinent to the provincial budget that was released a couple of weeks ago and how that provincial budget is, is working and investing to address some of these challenges that we mutually face. But as we know, the, the federal budget is going to be released tomorrow and I want to make uh, essentially two comments on the federal budget. First, we agree with your organization wholeheartedly that investing, the Investing in Canada infrastructure program or the ICIP program, it needs to be reloaded with funds so that provinces and municipalities can co-invest in building the communities where each of us live. ICIP and any other relevant transfers, investment transfers like the gas tax return, they need to remain as flexible as possible so that each community can continue to meet their specific challenges that, that they may have, the specific challenges that they may have in a growing community. Second, certainty needs to be restored for families in your community, my community, and across this nation. And we need to start with the removal of the consumer carbon tax for on everything for everyone. It does nothing but create higher costs for Saskatchewan and Canadian families. It does nothing but 
create higher costs for Saskatchewan and Canadian businesses, thereby declining that opportunity and that, that investment attraction opportunity that businesses may have, as well as it does nothing but increase the cost for Saskatchewan and Canadian communities, and you'll be seeing that as well. I would say that this will be my ask of the federal government tomorrow. Canadians will receive good news. This would be option number one. Canadians would receive good news in the way of increased community infrastructure investment and no carbon tax. My suspicion and my fear is that the federal government is going to provide Canadians with no community infrastructure funding and an increased carbon tax. In the past number of weeks, we have seen the federal government that has been pretty clear in signaling just this, that there will be no new municipal infrastructure funding and that the federal funds that were in our community infrastructure programs like ICIP and the gas tax refund those are going to be redirected to specific housing programs that are, let's call it, directed essentially at three of the largest communities in this nation. This is not the way for us to build a prosperous and affordable community in our province, and I would say largely across this nation, this is not the way forward in building prosperous and affordable communities for Canadians, and it's not the way to build a nation for that matter. If that's what we see in tomorrow's budget, you can expect our government to be very, very vocal in voicing our concerns, and I would encourage SUMA and your municipality uh, to be equal in that. Back to the province, the things that we can control. Our budget, which was released a couple of weeks ago, the 24-25 the provincial budget was released by our Deputy Premier, the Minister of Finance, the Honourable Donna Harpower. Um, you saw the availability of that investment into our communities that commitment from your provincial government to continue to invest into your community and every community in this province. The growth in our economy, the, the growth over the last number of years, in particular the last couple of years, has led to a record level of, inf of revenue, municipal revenue sharing this year. It's up 14%, $42 million, a total now of $340 million is going to be transferred through that no strings attached municipal revenue sharing program to our municipalities this year. That is only due to the strength and growth of the Saskatchewan economy. I would remind you of this, this revenue sharing formula that we have in this province. And I would say that it's imperative in addressing the growth that we see, that you see at your community or municipal council table. This revenue sharing formula stands alone in the nation of Canada. No other province, no other province has an agreement like we have here. And for those of you that attend FCM conventions, I would encourage you to ask if there is one. It's stable, it's predictable, it was asked for by you, and there are no strings attached. Since 2008, since 2008 now, over $4.3 billion in provincial revenue sharing has gone to your communities and all communities across this province. And I think that's something collectively as a province of Saskatchewan, we can be very, very proud of. That increase in revenue sharing, I think we can look at that as a, a very, the very gauge or the litmus, litmus test, if you will, of, of how our provincial economy is performing. How our provincial economy is doing. Is it expanding? Is it retracting? And I would say that it then thereby allows you to use those dollars and invest in your communities. It directly helps everyone in this room meet the challenges and opportunities of growth. And I would say once again that this investment, this $342 million this year, over $4.3 billion since its inception in 2008, it's only possible. It's only possible when you have a strong, vibrant, growing and prosperous economy. At budget time, You'll hear me here today talk about a lot of numbers, there's numbers and there's facts and there's figures and that's really all we talk about when it comes to budget time. But make no mistake on this, budgets are so much more than just those numbers and those facts and those figures. Budgets are about people. Most important budgets are about people, your budget or the provincial budget. People in Saskatchewan who expect and deserve a quality education. People in Saskatchewan who expect and deserve access to quality health care. And people in Saskatchewan who expect and deserve to be able to live in a healthy and safe community. 
Budgets are about people that are contributing to those very communities, to contributing to our, our economy. People who are busy building bright futures for themselves and, and their families. And that's why the focus on this year's budget has been very specific. It's about classrooms, it's about care, and it's about community. In addition to the 14% increase that we saw in municipal revenue sharing, as I said, is a, a ver the very gauge of, of how our provincial economy is performing. Through the strength of that very economy, we were able to invest and in, in invest substantially in our education budget. Our education budget was up 9% this year, up $180 million, the operational budget that will be transitioned or trans transferred to school division for a total of $2.2 billion. As I said, that's up 9%. Again, that's only possible due to the strength of a, of a strong and growing economy. That brings our education budget to the highest per capita education budget in the, na in the nation of Canada. What that means is that you and you and you and each of us as families in this province, we invest more per person in Saskatchewan in education than in any other province or any other region across the nation. And that collectively, I think, is something that we can be proud of as well. We recently announced an updated funding model in education to address the pressures from enrollment growth. And I'm going to comment on that in just a minute. There was a specialized support classroom pilot program, which was established a, a few months ago to support uh, the best learning environment in our classrooms across the province. Funding has been provided to support our educators, our teachers, through the Teacher Innovation and Support Fund. Again, so that they have input on that learning environment. And we, as we have in the past, we will continue to invest in new and improved schools across this great province in community after community. You've seen those investments in your community or one near you with 65 new and replacement schools that have been built over the last 16 years. There's 32 significant renovations that have occurred and in this budget just a few weeks ago, there is the announcement of nine additional schools that are going to be built in Saskatchewan and two uh, significant renovations. I want to just talk for, for one moment about one of those schools and about how quickly and aggressively our, our population is increasing. On the east side of Saskatoon, there's a, a joint use high school being built in either in the Brighton neighborhood or near, nearby. That school, I remember growing up, I grew up in the community of Shelbrook, Saskatchewan, uh, next to us, 25 miles away, it was a community of the city of Prince Albert. I remember Carlton High School in Prince Albert. It had 2,000, give or take a couple hundred uh, kids in it, in a high school. For many years, it was the largest high school in the province of Saskatchewan and coming from uh, our community where we had you know, about four or 500 kids in the entire school system, never mind just the high school. I always looked into that and I thought, man, that is, that is a big school. That, I sure don't want to play them in football. In the east side of Saskatoon, in that Brighton neighborhood, there's a joint use school facility that is going to be constructed that is going to be able to be the, the learning environment for 3,600 students. That is an indicator of how quickly our population is growing in our community. It's also an indicator why you're seeing the significant investment that you see today uh, in the education space. Because inside those very classrooms, inside those schools, we need to make sure that we have the resources so that our, our students, who are also our children, are able to learn and thrive. That's why you're seeing increased supports for increased supports for classroom learning. You're seeing increased supports for our educators. You're seeing increased supports in the number of educational assistants that are available. We need to, we, on all of those increased supports, you're seeing the very ability for us to allow our local school divisions and their boards to be able to make the decisions that are right for their schools, to be able to make the decisions that are right for their classrooms, and ultimately to make the decisions that are in the best interest of the students that are in those classrooms. A 9% lift in school operational funding is only possible due to the strength of a growing economy. When it comes to health care, and I'm sure there will be no questions in the bear pit on health care, like every other year, we're facing challenges in our health care system here in Saskatchewan. I would say that those challenges that we're facing in Saskatchewan are not exclusive to Saskatchewan. I jump on a call uh, every week or two with the other 12 premiers from across the nation and I can assure you that the challenges in healthcare in a post-pandemic world are across this nation and are not exclusive to Saskatchewan. Every province is dealing with them and we're trying to do what we can to work together 
to share solutions and equally as important to share things that didn't work so we don't try it in other areas. Do not do this. Do not doubt our commitment as a government to finding those solutions and funding those solutions as we uh, move through this, this time. In this budget, we have increased funding for health care by well over 10% just one year, and that's a big budget. That's a big line item in our budget. If you compare that to the negotiation that all provincial premiers had with the federal government when we asked them to move from a 19 or 20% share of our provincial health budgets to 35% share, which is where it was at the inception of the, of the Canada health transfer so many years ago, uh, they provide a 2.6% increase each year over the next five years. What you're seeing in provinces, in the province of Saskatchewan specifically, is over 10%. This increase brings our total health care budget to $7.6 billion a year. And I would say that that's a lot of money in, in a, as a line item in our, our provincial budget. And I would say that the expectations now of the government of Saskatchewan, and I would say the expectations of your municipality, I would hope, and the expectations of Saskatchewan families are this, that with that funding, that the Saskatchewan Health Authority delivers the health care services that Saskatchewan families expect. And we have access in or near our community that we expect. And we expect that the Saskatchewan Health Authority will make solid decisions with not only the base funding that they have, but this large increase that they have this year on where they invest those dollars. So that we have the right people in the right places, and I'll make a comment on that in a moment, so that we have our surgery wait times being addressed and coming down, and I'll comment on that in a moment, and so that the Saskatchewan Health Authority is able to make the investments, to make the lives of Saskatchewan people better. That's the goal. A few years ago, I would say that our, our government had put forward uh, the a Health Human Resource Action Plan. I've said many times it's the most ambitious health human resource action plan in the nation of Canada. The investments and the decisions that uh, have been made and funded with over $100 million of funding provided specifically to that plan, we're starting to see results. We're seeing more doctors and more nurses hired, more medical professionals hired into the Saskatchewan Health Authority in your community or, or one near you. This, just this last year, there's been over 1,000 Canadian nursing grads that have entered and are working in our health care facilities across Canada. You add to that uh, 400 Filipino nursing grads that have been offered, offered positions. 170 of them are actually in a Saskatchewan health care facility in a community today offering health care services. And so we are finding our way on the health human resource plan in hiring medical health professionals, most notably among them nurses. We're expanding the scope of many of the of the medical professionals that we have and paramount among that is expanding the scope of, of nurse practitioners. Nurse practitioners are now running clinics on their own independently of physicians. One open in Warman, one coming very shortly in Martinsville. We've added beds and capacity to our, to our hospitals and we're building new hospitals in Prince Albert and in Weyburn and planning now underway in Yorkton and in Rostern and in Esterhazy. And I would say this, wait times are starting to come down. In fact, wait times for surgeries in Saskatchewan are coming down and they're down 23% over the course of the last 24 months. It doesn't feel like that when you're waiting for a surgery, but they are down 23%. And I would say for a couple of reasons. One in part, that very ambitious health human resource action plan that I had mentioned that is bringing more medical professionals to work in our hospitals. Some of those are helping us reduce our surgical wait times. And in part, and I make no apologies for this second part, this is a government that is not tied in any way to rigid ideologies on how we are going to offer health care services to Saskatchewan residents. We're open to pursuing paths that lead to better and faster care for our residents, whether it be in the, our surgical initiative, whether it be in how we deliver mental health and all too often subsequent addictions care. We've seen improvement in the surgical wait times with the help of publicly funded but privately delivered surgery clinics that are operating in a number of communities. And I, here is the numbers. Through the past nine months, from April to December of, of this, uh, the, the, the three quarters of this last fiscal year, and what we are seeing is 72,000 surgeries have been performed. That's up 6,000 from the year before. It's a record on a record. And we are on track to achieve our target, our goal, which is 100,000 surgeries this year. The target is for 90% of procedures to be done within 10 months. So people don't have to wait so long for the care that they need. And we're on track to exceed that target, to meet it and to exceed it. And again, I would say, 
that 10% increase in investment, that also important investment in access to quality health care in our communities across this province, it's only possible due to the strength of a growing economy. When it comes to those that are facing mental health challenges and all too often subsequent addictions challenges, and I want to talk about addiction specifically, We've been very clear the last number of months. We do not believe that government should help people continue to use illegal drugs. We believe that government's role is one that helps those very people move away from the use of illegal drugs. In particular, those illegal drugs that are available in our nation today. There is no such thing today as a safe use of illegal drugs. A few months ago, we we had announced our five-year action plan for mental health and addiction. ROST was the word of the day. ROST stands for Recovery Oriented System of Care. First, when it comes to a ROST delivery, care delivery system, we need capacity. Where once there was a number of one-off supports, there is now a very focused and coordinated plan when it comes to offering addiction supports. It includes a significant increase in the number of intensive recovery beds that are available across this province. And these are new beds, of which five years ago we had virtually none. You all know we had a target of creating 150 of these intensive recovery beds. We were able to meet that target in this past year. We've extended that target to 500 beds, now well on our way to meeting the 500 bed target. And I don't think 500 is going to be the end of the conversation. We are going to need to continue building to provide those opportunities for our community members and all too often our family members that may have entered a life of addictions and, and want to make a change. We need to have the capacity to provide them that intensive addiction recovery support and we're building it. Second, we need access. We need to be able to get one. You need to be able to get into the system to provide the supports that, that you may need and you need them today. When you make that decision, you can't be told to come back next Thursday. Part of that access to those addiction supports you're seeing on North Albert Street here, and I'd encourage you to drive by it in Regina on North Albert Street on your way uh, to your hotel or on your way out of town when you leave, if you live north of the city, and if not, detour by it. You're seeing the construction of the urgent care center. Part of that urgent care center, part of that footprint is, yes, to see as many urgent folks, uh, people that have urgent health care issues, but maybe not emergent, doesn't belong in the emergency center, but can't wait for 10 days to see their primary care provider, you can go to the urgent care center and see uh, whatever that ailment might be, whether it's you or your family member, immediately, without being in the emergency room. The second part, and maybe less talked about part, of these urgent care centers, the one is constructed, uh, actually complete, the construction is complete in Regina and will be opening this summer, and an, uh, a very similar one is coming in Saskatoon uh, as soon as we're able to get it constructed. But the second part of that, is to be an intake for those that may be having a mental health crisis or have entered a life of addictions and are, are ready to make a change. An emergency room is for life-threatening health conditions, and it's not the right place for people that are struggling with addiction. We know that in this city all too well. So the urgent care center there is going to offer this 24-hour mental health and addictions care to support anyone in need and going to take them by the hand and provide them with the medical health professional that they require or ultimately to provide them with one of the intensive recovery beds that we are currently constructing the capacity for. And you can see how this five-year mental health and addictions plan, this recovery-oriented system of care is starting to come together. You need access and behind that access you ultimately need the capacity. Investments like this are only possible, and I say only possible, and they're not being made anywhere else in Canada. They're only possible through the strength of a growing economy. And while we need to continue to care for all of those vulnerable folks that we may have in our, in our communities through providing that, that recovery-focused system of care, we must also have a parallel focus. We must focus on getting illicit drugs out of our community and off our streets. You know all too well, many of you in this room, and I've seen it, the effects that these illegal activities and these illegal drugs have in our communities, whether it's direct in, in the drugs themselves or whether it's an associated property crime. This year's budget continues to commit and commits record funding to our RCMP, to our municipal police services, and to our provincially coordinated 
enforcement officers as well. And we remain in this province committed to all levels of enforcement. Our CMP, our municipal, our municipal police forces in the seven communities that have those. But we also remain committed to funding the Saskatchewan Marshal Service, which will be operational by 2026. And it doesn't replace any of the aforementioned enforcement agencies that we have. Nor will it be in comp competition for provincial funding. Instead, the Marshals is there to support our municipal police services when it is needed. Our marshals will be there 70 men deep to support our RCMP, whether that be in presence or whether that be in actual action, when it is required. They're there to support our other law enforcement agencies and they're there to support your community. That investment is only possible due to the strength of a growing economy. I mentioned earlier at the outset, certainty. And when we talk about the strength of a growing economy and the benefits of living in a, in a community in the province of Saskatchewan, behind it all is really certainty. Our continued economic growth, which is the, the, the currency of which we make investments, locally or provincially. Being able to answer the call of our citizens, the call that they may have on you to invest, the call that those very citizens may have on their provincial government to invest. That all requires certainty. And the best way for us to frighten away investment in our in our province is to sow the seeds of, of uncertainty. You've heard me talk before about a number of federal policies. I'm not going to talk about them a lot today. But there's regulations and legislation that are, are happening at the federal level that, quite frankly, not only hurt Saskatchewan residents, but hurt all Canadians by extensions by creating uncertainty and by threatening the opportunity we have for ongoing economic growth. <coughs> we have the clean electricity regulations. We have the clean fuel standards. We have the fertilizer reduction reg regulations, we have the oil and gas emissions cap, we have the methane regulations, and on top of all of it, you have an imposed federal carbon tax. So I'm not going to take a lot of time today to outline each of these, these policies, but let me say this. <coughs> all of those measures, and each of those measures, can cause uncertainty in this great pro province. They cause uncertainty across Canada, and I would say that they are causing uncertainty that Canadians quite simply can't afford today. It causes uncertainty for our producers, whether it be oil producers, whether it be agricultural producers. It causes uncertainty for our manufacturers, for our miners. It causes uncertainty for those that are looking to invest in Saskatchewan. And I would say eventually, all of those policies or each of those policies cause uncertainty for all of us that live in Saskatchewan. The success of, of businesses and industries, it's vital to to ensuring the continued growth in our economy, it's vital for us to continue to talk about the investments that I have discussed here today. And I would add this, that those investments, they're not just adding buildings and jobs. They are doing that and that's very important and that is the focus. But their success also means that they are directly investing into your community. And we've seen a number of those in recent weeks. We saw BHP make a significant investment into the Saskatoon Food Bank. We saw Nutrien make a significant investment to Sask Polytechnic to advance the building of their new college avenue, their college campus in Saskatoon. <coughs> uh, we're seeing the Rime family do uh, a like investment. We've seen investments into Stars Air Ambulance. We've seen investments into our local hospital foundation. We've seen provincial uh, charities that do very, very well in this province per capita, better than anywhere else in the nation. Charities like Tell America, where you see the entire Saskatchewan business community and individuals coming together to invest in families. You've seen these investments in your community. You've seen them across the province. Sponsorship of community events, funding to help, help build and maintain hockey arenas, other recreational infrastructure. And you have my commitment to this, that we will continue to build certainty for all of those that are looking to invest in your community. You need to be equally as committed to providing that very certainty that allows you to do your part in attracting that investment to our great province and to, I would say, our great nation. Because that investment leads to increased revenue. It leads to increased jobs and careers in your community, whether they be direct or, or indirect jobs. It, it leads to increased opportunities for Saskatchewan families that allows us to all work together and work collaboratively in building this great province. Investments that lead to opportunities for each and every Saskatchewan resident. Investments that will continue to attract newcomers to Saskatchewan and I would say equally or more importantly, offer our children the opportunity to stay here. 
It's investments that we, as I said, are leading the nation in. Investments that are building that strong and prosperous economy that I have mentioned here today. And part of that very certainty that we require, part of that very certainty is provided, or needs to be provided at the federal level. Part of it needs to be provided at the provincial level. But part of it also needs to be provided by each of you in this room, through our local government. And I'm here today to close by saying this. Thank you. Thank you to each of you and collectively to all of you for being such great partners with us as your provincial government as we continue to, yes, meet the challenges of growth, but also enjoy in the opportunities that that growth provides the residents that we collectively serve, and that is the people and families of this great province. I'm wishing you the very best in the SUMA conference this week. Thank you. Meanwhile, the leader of the official opposition, Carla Beck, elocuted the Saskatchewan NDP's approach to working hand-in-hand -hand with municipal leaders, offering insights into how the party aims to foster effective cooperation and address the needs of local communities. Here is Carla Beck's full address to delegates. Well, good morning. Good morning, Suma. It's wonderful to be here with you today to gather with you on Treaty 4 territory, the homeland of the Métis. And I want to start first by saying thank you to Randy and to Jean-Marc and to the whole board of directors of SUMA and to all of you. And if you'll let me just rectify one wrong, when I spoke at SARM earlier this year, I neglected to say thank you um, to Ray Orb and his wife Val, who are seated in the audience here tonight. Uh, and wish you well in your future endeavors and made it, um, may it entail much more traveling over the next few years. Thank you for your service. <laughs> now, I was going to introduce a whole team of MLAs here today, but I think that they cut out of caucus meeting early to be here. I'm going to get them all uh, to stand up, this, this team of opposition MLAs here. Um, and, and give a wave and, and know that uh, they want to hear very much from you, continue to hear from you. Please seek them out. Um, and I want to make one, one introduction here, and that is uh, one of our candidates who is also known to you as a counselor from LaRange, uh, Mr. Jordan McPhail, um, our candidate in Cumberland. I just wanted to have him give a wave and, and thank him for his service. Now, there's one member of our team who, who is not here at this very moment, but has been here for most of the convention, and that is Erica Ritchie, our municipalities critic and the critic for water security. I know she's had a chance to meet with many of you as she's been around the province doing outreach in every corner of the province, and I want to make sure that you do reach out to her because she very much wants to hear from you if she hasn't already. And... This team, I want to say and, and say from the stage how incredibly proud, as you heard from Randy, how incredibly proud I am of the work that they are doing, making connections with people right across this province, and they'll all be sticking around. I believe that this team and the few that we did leave back at the, at the legislature, that this team represents the positive change and approach to politics and decision making that a growing number of people across this province tell me that they're looking for. This is a team that is committed, not just in word, but in deed, to outreach and collaboration, and a team that knows that the only way that we can effectively tackle the challenges and opportunities ahead of us is by working alongside our municipal partners. We know that we are stronger together. And this is a team that's committed to building on those existing relationships, creating new ones, and truly listening to local voices. And we also understand that local need leaders need to be meaningfully engaged in order to achieve the results that we all want for our hometowns. Now, you may have heard, you may have sensed, 
that it's an election year. Certainly for us at the provincial level and for many of you here in the room today. So let me be straight and cut to the chase. As proud as I am of this team and the work that we've done from opposition, we are not in this for second place. Now, I also know that probably every leader of the opposition that has addressed this assembly has told you the same thing. And I'm under no illusions about the work that we have in front of us. But I am standing here with my feet firmly planted, committing that we will continue to build so that we can win the next election and deliver the change that this province needs. Now, we've got some momentum, but we are certainly not taking anything for granted, nor are we slowing down. You have our commitment to keep working every day to build those connections, to build the trust, and getting input, input from people across this province, and to continue to put forth common sense solutions. Now, whether I'm at the family bull sale or in other rooms where they maybe haven't seen an NDP MLA for a while, I'm hearing more and more that people are seeing how hard this team is working, how they're connecting, and how they're focused on the things that matter. The word impressive is something I hear a lot, and I believe that as well. Impressive leadership like we see here in this room. And I'm hearing from more and more people in more and more rooms that it's time for a change. And as someone who grew up in rural Saskatchewan, who still has family and communities in the north and the south, and as someone who raised my own children in the city, in the heart of Regina, I know that as a province, we are not made stronger when we are divided down urban and rural lines. In fact, it's quite the opposite. And as we go about this province, there are two main themes that emerge. Regardless of where you live in this beautiful province, we all still share many of the same values and the same goals. And I also hear that people are far more interested when you get away from the din of it all in practical common sense results than they are in rhetoric and division shown, uh, sown solely to further partisan ends. And know that I mean this both at the provincial level and at the federal level. Solutions will not be found in Twitter battles and definitely not in small rooms in Ottawa or in Regina. Now, I know that you all will have your own your own examples of this, but I'm gonna take one right after I take a sip of water here. Let's look at the very real and long-standing concerns about the rising rates of crime and response rates. Concerns that have been put forth by SUMA and SARM, raised by the RCMP and municipalities for years. We've engaged in that advocacy with many of you in this room. I think going back to when I was first elected in 2016 might have been the first time. But what did we see as a response from the provincial government? We saw a surprise announcement in 2022 of a marshal service and a promise of $20 million, coincidentally what the RCMP was looking for, and a promise that it would be up and running by 2026, after the election. Now here we are, two years in, $14 million spent, and not a single pair of new boots on the ground, or a support worker, or anything to address the still rising rates of crime in your communities. Let me say this as plainly as I can. 
dropping surprise legislation on what should be your major stakeholders and partners on throne speech day or budget day is not acceptable. And then by billboard or PR campaign or closed door meetings or veiled threats, working to get people on side is not good faith consultation. It does not show trust and respect that local leaders deserve and that you're due. And it certainly doesn't get us the results that we need. Now, the Marshall Service is an, an example of many, but I think a, fairly, a fairly illustrative one of how you can spend more, get less, and take longer than it needs to because you refuse to engage in good faith problem solving and collaboration in the first place. But sadly, this is just one example. I'll look briefly at education. Back to those values we all share. We all want our kids to be in school, getting the very best education that we can provide them. The extracurriculars too. We also understand the importance of local voice, of local school boards and education. And we also understand that teachers and frontline staff play a vital role in delivering that education that our kids and this province need. Now, as a former school board trustee, I understand the reluctance to put some of these items in the, in the CBA, especially given that we have a government that failed to fully fund the teacher's contract back in 2019. But after a decade of devastating cuts and underfunding, decreased transparency and encroachments on school board autonomy, for the SAS party to now wrap themselves in the flag of board autonomy is more than a bit rich. We need a deal. We need them back at the table. This is another example of how the move away from transparency and accountability with respectful and solution-focused engagement with stakeholders and other levels of government, the move away from that towards top-down decision-making, consolidation of information and power in smaller and smaller rooms, actively sowing division and pitting group against group is not leading to better solutions or to better results. And I think this is a troubling pattern. I've already heard that here in the room today. We see next door in Alberta, I think you know the bill I'm gonna talk about. Tabling a bill that blocks everyone in the province from getting federal funding, funding unless it goes through the provincial government. Whether that's university or healthcare funding, no more federal funding, including to cities and municipalities without the province's say so. I understand that this is the latest attempt to stand up to Ottawa, but it could cost municipalities millions in infrastructure and other funding and block economic activity and cost jobs. And it shows, let me be clear about this, a total disrespect for local voices. I hope that the provincial government is not looking too closely at this bill. And I think we all as leaders, regardless of political stripe, would do well to remember that this country and this province do not belong to any of us. We are called as leaders to make the best decisions based on the best information for those we serve, whether they vote for us or donate to us or not. Now, sometimes that happens at the provincial level and the federal level, but it's a lot harder for that to happen at the municipal level. Some of you know that my dad served as a counselor, an RM counselor for 30 years. And he always made sure to invite me to the SARM luncheon. He said one of the best places to get the real pulse of this province. I mostly agree with him. This is also another one of those rooms to get the pulse of what's going on across this province. And I also learned in rooms like these that transparency, trust, and civility still mean something 
the people in Saskatchewan. And that can, that can surely include a good face-to-face -face heated debate over things that really matter. These are the keys to serving well. And I also know that the only way to build real trust in politics is to say the same thing in every room. I suspect that you'll hear the Premier talk about it, so I want you to hear it from my lips. Let me be clear. I stand against Ottawa's carbon tax, something I've made clear time and time again in the legislature and in Ottawa. And I have never, ever had a problem standing up for what I believe. In fact, I think it's the lack of the ability to keep my mouth shut that got me into politics in the first place. And let me also say this, because the Premier sometimes leaves this out when he's telling this story. When it comes to the carve-out of heating fuel, we were the ones who put forth the motion in the first place, opposing the federal carve-out for heating oil from home, for home heating, while keeping the tax on those who use other forms. We did so because it did not pass a fairness test that people expect of their leaders, and especially not at a time when people right across the country are struggling to pay their bills. But at the same time, we also oppose all of the ways that the provincial government is making life more expensive. And I will always speak out against policies that hurt Saskatchewan people. I do not care who is promoting them. But unlike the current Premier, I will also insist to be at the table and willing to find solutions that benefit Saskatchewan people, regardless of who's on the other side. And also unlike the Premier, I do care about rising emissions and understand that climate change presents real danger to our threat or threat to our health, to our infrastructure, and to our way of life. And finding ways to combat climate change, I know, has been on your minds as well for years. And those local voices do matter. And like so many decisions made at other levels of government, it will be municipalities who stand to disproportionately be impacted by any action or inaction on this front. We support your plan to streamline working together through a climate change action center. And at the same time, we also need to do all we can do to promote and sustain the cities and communities and industries that are the lifeblood of this province. We've got to work together to continue to attract investment, to support small businesses, and attract corporate head offices. And we need to invest in infrastructure and services that will keep people in Saskatchewan. We need the voice of Saskatchewan to be in Ottawa, making sure that we get deals for infrastructure that benefit all provinces. I want to thank you for your direct and constructive advocacy on this front, and we are happy to lend our voices. And speaking of effective advocacy, the importance of pr predictable funding, municipal revenue sharing, we understand the importance and how long you fought for that. Now, I know the Premier's not shy to remind you of the money that comes your way, and that's fair enough. But I also notice less of a mesh a mention of the costs that have been downloaded onto municipalities. Whether it's direct costs, like the 2016 post-election surprise addition of PST on construction labor, or more indirectly, by allowing mental health and addictions to go unchecked despite warnings and advocacy on your part, and making things worse by introducing changes with the CIS program that only added to homelessness in your communities. Let's be clear about this. We need more jobs, not fewer, and we need safer communities for small businesses and the economy 
to thrive and survive. And these two items, these two issues are not unrelated. The fact is, for Saskatchewan people to do well and for our communities to do well, we need the economy to do well. So let's check some facts. Premier Scott Moe has the worst job creation record in the country before, during, and after the pandemic. They've balanced one budget in the last 10 years, nine deficits and counting, and tripled the provincial debt. Now, I know my numbers are right. I've got Ron Stiles here who's joined us, who fact checks all the time. But I also know that the real experts are in these rooms. And I can't answer this for you, but I want you to think about the answers to this at your table. Are people better off in your community than they were in 2018? Are families having an easier time paying their bills? Has our health care system gotten better? Do health care workers that you know feel more supported or more invited to be part of the solutions? Is it easier for people in your community, your loved ones, to access primary care? Has our education system improved? Are you more confident in your kids' or your grandkids' ability to build a life and raise their family here at home? If you answered no to any of these, I don't need a show of hands. Just know that you are not alone. And I am not up here. I'm a realist. I'm not up here to tell you that I can wave a magic wand and make everything better. Because I can't. But I do know that there are solutions to be found. And there is opportunity waiting in every corner of this province. I see it every day. And I can commit to you that this is a team that will do the work, reaching out, making those connections, and focused on getting the basics right. Practical ways of lowering costs, healthcare when you need it, and making the investments needed to ensure we have real connectivity across this province. Now friends, it's 2024, and broadband, access to internet, is not a luxury, it's a necessity. And I want to applaud the work of SUMA and SARM and the SBAC, all the partners, the work that you've done towards this end. And I think this is an example of the collaboration and fresh thinking and working backwards from the goal towards getting it done that we need to see more of. But I also want to say in Saskatchewan, we are uniquely positioned to be able to make this a reality in Saskatchewan. And if it was a priority for this government, we would be further along than we are right now. In the same light that I see rural electrification in the last century, this new project of ensuring every community every person in this province has broadband access, is and must be a priority. We will continue to put forth practical solutions built with leaders and stakeholders like those in this room. And we'll look for better ideas wherever they may be. I look to the, the left and the right of us on the political or on the geographical map in Alberta and Manitoba and I see that they've taken off the fuel tax something that this government could do today to save people 15 cents a liter something that's desperately needed we continue to call for that we've also called for prioritizing Saskatchewan companies and workers to do work here in Saskatchewan when we're using public dollars common sense solutions designed to keep the benefits here at home for those good jobs and those paychecks. And we will continue to focus on common sense solutions in healthcare built with local voices and frontline professionals. Solutions so that no one in this province, no woman in this province, ever has to get, again drive to Calgary to get a mammogram. Now, the Grow Your Own Plan 
I know it'll be familiar to those in this room, to get healthcare workers, including nurse practitioners, into your communities is a good idea. One built with voices in this room, and one that our health critic, Vicki Mullet, has been promoting for years. We've also called alongside other, along the nurse, alongside the nurses for a nursing or a health care task force. A very reasonable request that they've been asking for for years to address the critical, the critical need to retain health care workers in addition to recruiting them. And we will continue to work towards a provincial housing program that works with all levels of government but makes sense for Saskatchewan. And we will reverse changes to the CIS program that have made a very bad situation worse in so many ways. And moreover, you have my commitment, our commitment, that we won't ask you to be silent or ignore your advocacy except when it suits our own political ends. We understand that the path forward to that opportunity that we all want, it resides in including all voices. And I want to commend you this last budget, your advocacy around highlighting the fact that there was a $16 million cut to Northern transportation infrastructure, and we can commit to work with you to fix the duty, the broken duty to consult process. And we will make sure to work with you to ensure that there is funding so that all communities have access to the firefighting equipment and services that they need. I think I've probably taken more than my time. I want to just say, commend the organizers for this, the theme of this year's convention. Refresh, renew, and refocus. Something that we can all use sometimes. And it really is a wonderful theme for a spring convention. I was recently up on the hill at Librette and saw the first crocus. Always a hopeful sign. But sometimes a quick lick of paint or a new slogan or new headshots, they aren't enough. Sometimes, let's say, when a government has grown entitled to its entitlements and a little out of touch, they forget who they work for. And when that happens, it is indeed time for a change, a fresh new focus, if you will. A focus on empowering local voices and a belief that government is actually about getting things done for people. Not the kind of promises or rhetoric that say one thing before an election and deliver surprises and something very different the very next year. So I'll quickly touch on the most recent kinder, kinder gentler budget that we saw definitely an election year budget. But make no mistake, we've seen this budget before. And let me say this, we are a province of 1.2 and growing million people with $20 billion in revenue. This is not a resource problem, this is a mismanagement problem. We have abundant resources and we surely do have what the world needs, innovative, world-leading producers and agribusiness, but most importantly, leaders and people who know the value of hard work and the importance of strong, vibrant communities. And I want to say this in closing. Whether your family has roots on this land going back centuries or decades, or whether you're new to our province and our country, Everyone has a place and has pride in this beautiful province that we all call home. And Saskatchewan does have a beautiful story to tell, but this is not just a story about our past. It's also a story about our future. 
about what we could build when we work together. My team and I want to say thank you sincerely to Suma and all of you for your advocacy and your service to your community. And we continue to welcome every chance, every chance to work with you for the people we ultimately all serve in this province. I do believe that Saskatchewan's best days are ahead of us. And by working together, we can build that bright future that we all want for our communities, for our kids, and for our grandkids. And I cannot wait to continue to get out there and make it happen. Have a wonderful convention. Thank you very much. During the three-day conference, Municipal Affairs, this show, had the privilege of sitting down with mayors from diverse regions of the province. We posed a simple but yet overarching question to each and every single one of them. What are you looking for from the party leaders in the upcoming provincial election? Their responses were as varied as the communities they represent, reflecting the diverse array of challenges and priorities across Saskatchewan. First up, Lloyd Minster, Alberta, Saskatchewan Mayor, Gerald Elbers. Mayor Elbers, uh, City of Lloyd Minster, part of the province is going to an, uh, an election here in October provincially. What are you looking for from the two provincial parties or the three provincial parties, I should say, that represent the legislature for, from a municipal standpoint? Well, I really hope that they take hard look at infrastructure and understand that uh, you cannot have a hospital or a school without running water and sewer. And they don't provide the running water and sewer. That's provided by the municipality. So you can build all the new hospitals and new schools you want, but without running water and sewer and a road to get there, they're not going to be a very functional facility. So I think infrastructure is huge. We have challenges uh, in healthcare throughout Saskatchewan, big and small. Uh, we need doctors, we need nurses, we need to ensure that people don't have to travel hours upon hours to, to re obtain a service. And then certainly the homeless and addictive addiction and mental health files are huge on our side. Policing costs, there's, there's <laughs> the list is long and endless. I'm just getting started. I guess I can go warmed up. But, uh, you know, cost of policing with the RCMP, uh, there's new union negotiations ongoing. And I guess where does the province see their relationship with the federal government and how do we get all parties working together? Because if we don't get all three parties working together, there's a loss and the loss is the taxpayer and they still usually call me first. Next, we spoke with Lalage Mayor Georgina Jolibus. <clears throat> uh, just a one, two, three, perfect. Um, <laughs> Mayor, I want to thank you so much for doing this. I have one simple question, which I'm asking a lot of mayors. With the upcoming provincial election scheduled for October, is there anything you're looking for from the party leaders, whether it be the NDP or the SAS party, to address in this upcoming provincial election with regards to the LOSH? That's a very important question, and thank you for asking that. The residents who come to me, as well as coming to the council meeting and raising issues, the, the most... The, the top issues that we get as elected people, housing. Uh, we can, because we, our population is growing so fast that we're unable to, to, to keep up with the amount of houses that we can build. And so there's still a homelessness issue that we have among young and old. So that's one housing issue. Uh, the Patterson Lake with next gen and fishing, there's uranium and there's going to be they're going there is going to be, they say, a new mine. So opportunity that's just north of Lalash. So training opportunities and employment opportunities, prepare and that will help the economy. And people are really keen on this and it's very supportive. Healthcare issues, the the healthcare issues, the support that we need, the services, mental health and addictions. Um, those are the and then the improvement for the schools uh, to, to still acquire and, and hire teachers to move to Lalash. So those are the, the key issues that we have in the community. Now over to Seanovan Mayor Kyle Bennett. Mayor Bennett, provincial election coming up here. What are you hoping to hear from both provincial party leaders about the municipal issues that you're being faced with and particularly the town of Seanovan? I guess uh, municipal issues 
I mean, healthcare is always an issue, right? Uh, but we're in, we're in constant contact with our, our leaders and, and with SUMA as well. But, um, you know, it is something that concerns us, especially in the rural. But RCMP is a big issue. We've gone through some staff changeovers and things like that, and we've had to amalgamate with our neighbouring communities. And, and that is a big concern uh, going forward. You know, and even learning learning about the plan with the Marshall program and things like that, right? We really want to know what's what's going on and and if you know if it's worthwhile, right? Stuff like that. Um, and, and I mean, carbon tax is the biggest one. Uh, you're probably tired of talking about that. But <laughs> I would never be tired of anything that municipal <laughs> leaders want to talk about on this show. Yeah, I, I, we want to continue, and I'm glad to, to hear Carla Beck. Uh, say that the NDP is is against the carbon tax and and as well as the Sask Party because I think that's a pretty strong opinion of of everybody in our region and our town. It's it's driving up the cost of everything. Moose Jaw Mayor Clive Tolley had a very unique ask for provincial leaders in this year's provincial election. Oh, okay. you're, I'm going to ask you one simple question. It's a okay. political question. Okay. Provincial elections coming up here in yes. October. Yeah. As the mayor of Moose Jaw, is there anything you're looking for from the party leaders to address when it comes to your municipality? Um, we want to have the traffic lights installed on 9th Avenue and the Trans Canada Highway. Um, we've had a history of bad accidents there. Uh, we have slowed the traffic down to 80 with the cooperation of the Highways Department. Um, and they've been great to work with, and now I think we'd like to extend that and actually have a traffic stop there. Um, and as I said uh, to some of the elected officials, well, if you stop and you look around, you might say, hey, let's go into Moose Jaw and spend some time here. So I think probably the, the biggest thing I'd like to see uh, is uh, traffic lights on the Trans-Canada Highway at 9th Avenue and the Trans-Canada Highway and uh, urge people then for safety reasons to stop and also to have a good look at our community and spend some time here. While Craven Mayor Dana Anderson wanted the leaders to address one big challenge facing her community. Uh, Mayor Anderson, thank you so much for doing this. I just have a simple question. With the provincial election coming up here in October, party leaders are going to be crisscrossing this province, addressing issues that cross this province from a residential standpoint. Is there anything as mayor of the village of Craven that you're looking to hear from the party leaders prior to uh, the election day in October? Yeah, I think, um, again, as a small community, I'm sure our priorities are very different than that of a large city. Um, I know there seems to be a very strong focus from the federal government also on housing specifically. That for us is not an issue. Um, infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure is the big one for us. We want increased funding for it. We want increased access, more grants, whatever they need to do to help small communities like ours actually find funds to make the changes that we need to make so that our communities don't just peter out and become ghost towns. We don't want that. <laughs> And Mayor Daniel Powder of the Northern Hamlet of Stony Rapids wanted the leaders to address a myriad of different issues. Uh, Mayor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciated. Um, simple question. Provincial election is happening this year in October. Uh, is there an issue that you are hoping that the provincial parties will address during this upcoming provincial election? Well, I really hope that uh, they uh, look at our education and our schools because uh, the need justice program is going to be needed really, really so that uh, our kids will learn. And then also uh, I like to, to have them look at our infrastructure. Our infrastructure in our community is very poor because uh, it, it costs over a million dollars to uh, construct a subdivision. So, so those kind of issues I want to look at in housing. Housing is uh, one of the biggest things that we need for, for the North, and I think that uh, with the uh, provincial government with going into the new election, I think they'll, they'll open their eyes and see what the, what's going on here. We want to thank the Saskatchewan Urban Municipality Association for inviting us to this year's SUMA AGM in Regina. This episode would not have been achievable without their support. 
So if this episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to our in-depth conversations with municipal leaders from across Canada on the cross-border interviews and our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. We are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. But your support is the backbone of our growth and the maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking.